break. Um, this is on behalf of the innovation team, which uh, Amelia is part of, and Becky is also on there. Um, there's several other of us, but um, just for who's on the call today, that's who I see. Um, and today we are excited to have Lindsay Leaker, she's from the State 4-H office, talk to us about the impact of music on the brain. And um, cause, and we came up with this idea because if some of us work on, you know, maybe PowerPoints or different things, we sometimes listen to music and the question came up, you know, is that a good thing? Is it a bad thing? Uh, does it help spark creativity or, you know, can it be kind of a distraction? So. We're really excited and happy that Lindsay could join us. And so, Lindsay, if you would want to take it away, uh, we'd, we're happy to hear from you. Okay, can you hear me, Alicia? Can yep, I can hear you. Okay. I, want to sh I should have said, too, we'll have um, some question and answer, um, too, at the end. So if people have questions, either type them in the text box or, you know, be sure to ask Lindsay, too. Okay. I will get started here then. So um, Alicia had contacted me to see if I would talk about how music impacts the brain specifically while working and studying. So I put together some information about that. Uh, it's mostly on music in the brain and then is it a good or bad thing while you're studying or working? So most of you know this, but I used to teach neuro, well, actually I still teach neuroscience, but um, that was my kind of main class I taught when I was teaching. So I really like to talk about neuroscience in the brain. So that is good. All right, oh, I just skipped around my slides already. Hold on. I might have to start in this view just because this slide is not showing up for some reason. And then I'll go back to the full view here in a minute. But um, I just thought I'd start with talking a little bit about how you process sound because our auditory sense is super, super cool. It's like a little man put together a mechanical, well, I'm into Rube Goldberg machine. So, um, like a Rube Goldberg machine in your ear, and it somehow works to capture noise and sound and process, and then send it on to process in the brain. So um, my background's in vision, but I think the auditory part of the brain is really cool too. So I'll show you a figure here in a minute, and I'll kind of explain it more in the figure, but here are some major things that happen when sound hits your ear. So sound enters through the ear canal, which is the funnel shaped ear lobe. Well, not just the lobe, but the entire ear. And then it sets off a bunch of vibrations through the eardrum, the cochlea. And then there's, um, we have auditory cells, sense organs in the cochlea, which are just basically hair cells that move with vibration. And then that generates a nerve pulse that gets sent to your brain. And I'll show you a picture of the brain in a few minutes. But audition is, or sound in this case, is processed in the temporal lobe of the brain. So I'll move on here and I'll make my PowerPoint bigger. There's a lot of big terms on here, and I would never even call them those terms. But um, the outer ear is, like I said, what funnels the sound waves into our ear. and a lot of older people before hearing aids were made would like put a, they would like cup their hand around their ear. That actually does help funnel sound waves into your ear. Um, so that's really what our ear does. And then the ear canal is also called somewhat of the outer ear and it funnels sound waves into the middle and inner ear. Once you hit the middle ear, which is the three tiniest bones of our body, the hammer, anvil, and it's sometimes called the stapes. Here it's stapes or stirrup. They actually, amp those bones move like basically a Rube Goldberg machine, just like a really simple little machine that, that amplifies the waves. So once the waves are amplified, it bangs against something called the oval window, which is not on this figure, but it's right where the stapes is. And then the cochlea is the snail shaped thing and that's considered the inner ear and it's water filled and there's hair cells in there. So when the stapes bangs against the oval window, it moves the water, which then moves the hair cells. And depending on how far 
the water moves the hair cells and how much it moves the hair cells that tells our brain everything we need to know about what we're hearing. So somehow we are able to process that into sound, which is crazy. So um, I just ha I'll show you where the temporal lobe is in a, in a few minutes here, but here's just some intro into what happens when we listen to music. Most of this is based on classical music, so we'll talk about non-classical music too, but a lot of the research that I have in here is based on classical. So the right hemisphere of the brain is known as more of the arts, artsy musical side of the brain, and when we hear any sort of melody with different pitch and timbres, it lights up, and so it gets super active, and all the neurons are firing, all the connections are being strengthened, um, that have to do with music, but um, specifically classic, classical music or when you also read music, that, that lights up the left hemisphere, which is the more, the more logical part of our brain. So if you listen to music, both hemispheres of the brain light up, and I don't want you to think that that's something out of the ordinary because for most tasks, both sides of the brain light up. They help each other out, but for music, it really lights it up bright. So if you ever look at a figure that shows brain activity, red means high activity. And with classical music or some sort of piece that has um, a lot of different melodies, et cetera, it will light up the brain bright. So it's always good to stimulate the right and the left hemisphere. And so that's one thing that classical music specifically does. So here's the brain and you can see the temporal lobe. Um, the, uh, just to give you a little background, so the occipital lobe is vision, the parietal lobe is sensory information, temporal is audition, which is hearing and speech, so that's what we're most concerned with uh, for this presentation, and then frontal lobe is thinking, personality, all sorts of higher order functions that make us human. So, uh, and it makes sense that our temporal lobe gets that information because it's right behind the ear both ears. So all that information goes to the temporal lobe. And once that musical information is processed, it gets sent on to higher order areas. So that's just a really basic, basic overview of the brain, um, <clears throat> just so that you can kind of see where the temporal lobe was. Another big, so when I say the ear gets the sound waves, the sound waves go through the ear, it's then processed in the temporal lobe. The temporal lobe is the first part of the brain that processes anything that we hear, and then it sends it on to higher order areas. So a higher order area is the limbic system, and the limbic system is one of the coolest areas of the brain. It's the emotional center of the brain, um, and there's a lot of different parts that are involved with the limbic system. I'll show you a picture of it here in a little bit. Um, if someone's depressed, they have a problem with their limbic system. So when we think of music, we think about a lot of times positive emotions. So we listen to music because we enjoy listening to that music and it, this does not just have to be classical music in this case, um, but because we like it and um, it makes us happy. So it evokes positive emotions in the limbic system. So love, humor, um, and then it also gets our brain active. So it allows us to have better cognition. It can, a music can evoke negative emotions. I actually just taught neuroscience this morning and we watched brain games and they were doing um, some organ music that they use in horror films. And that sort of music will automatically evoke, not necessarily anger unless you associate some song with something bad that happened to you, but a lot of times fear. And so the limbic system not only has to do with positive emotion, but it also has to do with negative emotion. And so if you're fearful or anxious because of something that you hear, it will then help you avoid that. Maybe you don't go closer to that noise or you do something to get away. So it can also have a little bit to do with negative emotion and survival. The big neurotransmitter of the limbic system and neurotransmitters are basically hormones in your brain. And so they make us have certain feelings and behaviors. Um, 
I, I really do mean that. So hormones and neurotransmitters are the same thing. It's just that hormones are in your blood and neurotransmitters are in your brain. So it makes you think, it makes you have emotions, uh, makes you feel good after you eat. All of those are just chemical messengers in the brain. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about serotonin because when you're happy from listening to music, it's serotonin that's involved. So like I said, serotonin is a neurotransmitter and it helps us maintain happy feelings. And so when we feel happy or when we do something that we like to do, serotonin is released. It also helps us relax. And so when we think about the limbic system as a fight or flight system as well, um, serotonin is involved with rest and digest. So if you're, let's say you hear scary music and you have a fight or flight response that's evoked and then you realize that it's just some song on TV and there's nothing to be afraid of. So you had a little bit of a heightened response and now you're feeling okay. So serotonin is involved with that resting and like getting your energy back. Uh, people that are depressed, they have a deficit in not only the limbic system, but also the, the chemicals that are related to the limbic system. So like I said, serotonin is one. People are on, most times if you're depressed or anxious, they'll start with an SSRI. And SSRIs are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. And that I could spend a whole hour explaining, but basically what it does is it increases serotonin in your brain. So it helps those people calm if you're anxious, or it helps those people feel better because it will um, have to do with an increase in positive mood doesn't happen right away though. It takes a number of weeks once you start an SSRI. So, and again, I could spend a whole a whole hour on that. So um, if you have questions, you can ask me. But serotonin is very involved with feeling good and feeling happy. So every neurotransmitter in our brain has different systems. So it operates like in different parts of the brain. So Dopamine is the major reward neurotransmitter of the brain and it operates in a very small system. So it doesn't it doesn't like have an influence on a large part of the brain, but serotonin does. And so this is just showing how serotonin affects basically the entire brain. Um, the big area that it surrounds is the limbic system. So um, the limbic system, I can't obviously point right now, but uh, if you see the center of this picture of the brain, it's like a medial cut. So it's just cutting it straight down the center. Um, it's You'll see the brain stem and then right after the brain stem is the limbic system. And so it looks like it's right on top of the brain stem there. Um, that's, that's the limbic system. And I say things get from the temporal lobe to higher order processing. The limbic system is still not super high order. It's just the next step in processing. So if you think about survival skills, we need to have emotions like right away in order to respond in the best way necessary to survive. So it is still a fairly lower level system of the brain. So that's where serotonin operates and then it sends out good messages to the rest of the brain. Okay, so if we try and like think back to music now. So if you're listening to music that you like and it doesn't necessarily have to be classical, it is releasing serotonin and serotonin is basically communicating with all the other parts of your brain, telling the brain that you're feeling good and you're happy. So that's not necessarily a bad thing. Okay. Um, if you're listening to, and that's any kind of music. So if you're listening to classical music, um, it activates the brain in a higher way, which allows you to cognitively think um, I don't want to say faster or it just it kind of kind of activates your brain in a way that makes you more open to learning because there's a lot more going on with classical music and there's actually some mathematical things that happen with classical music and that's why it it activates that left brain. So that's a serotonin system. Um, talked a lot about classical music. So here's some specifics for classical music. I'm just going to check my time here quick. Oh, I'm golden. Okay. Um, so here's some specific research that's been done on classical music. So in humans, when we listen to classical music, 
it enhances our short and long-term memory and also spatial IQ. The blue part of that figure is called the hippocampus. It's part of the limbic system that we just talked about, but it specifically has to do with memory. So the entire limbic system is emotion and making yourself feel good. And when you think about, well, what does that have to do with memory? Well, a lot of times if we want to find, and this goes back to caveman days, but if we want to find food, we need our memory system. And when we get that food, we feel good. And so it's all linked in the same system. So uh, classical music has the ability to help with storing short-term memory into long-term memory. Lots of research on kids and classical music. And the, the, re, the, the findings are mixed, but there is a lot of evidence that classical music increases cognitive skills in children. And that might mean something like making them more open to learning, like I said, better memory, better attention, just kind of activating that brain so it's, it's more active. Um, my son Brody, when he was in kindergarten, his teacher always had classical music going on while they were working, not when she was talking, but while they were working. And so that suggests that he thought that it helped in some way. Now, she wasn't a researcher, but she was seeing some sort of change from playing that in the classroom. Melody and rhythm are um, parts of classical music that are a little bit different than country music or whatever you might listen to. But that's really where some of the mathematical stuff comes in. And that helps with brain organization and different uh, and activating different areas of the brain. Here's some more things on classical music. So um, music can affect your hormone system by affecting breathing rate and skin conductance. I don't know if that really matters too much, but it's something that research has found. Pupils dilate, blood pressure and heart increases. It kind of makes you more aware of your surroundings, allows the brain to concentrate more easily, and also take in information in less time. So that's the memory part of that. Uh, like we talked about earlier, music also stimulates the left and right hemispheres of the brain if it's classical. So that um, makes our brain active and more open to getting information. I found something that said learning can be increased fivefold, but I don't know that I really agree with that. So I need to look more into that resource, but I thought some of you might find that interesting. And if you're interested, I can get you the, the specific resource for that. So all in all, it seems that classical music tends to increase learning. So I guess that's the take home message with classical music. This is something that was studied oh, probably when I was in college, so like 10 years ago, and it's called the Mozart effect. And it was specifically looked at with babies. And actually the baby study was super inconclusive because you can't really do research on, well, you can. So a lot of the moms, what they did is they played Mozart while they were pregnant. And then what they wanted to do was look at like IQ and some other things. So the longitudinal study is the kids got older. So we had to do longitudinal research like that because people drop out. But also those kids are exposed to so many other things. Who's to say it was the music that was being played while the mom was pregnant. So a lot of other researchers kind of had some, they weren't too happy about that. And so there's mixed findings with that specific study, but it led to a bunch of other research on playing classical music. Um, specifically, they started with Mozart um, and looking at brain function. So a lot of this I talked about already, but spatial temporal reasoning, which is spatial IQ, like finding your way or using a map, um, increases short -term memory, increases um, but specifically Mozart concerto from Baroque, the Baroque period. Um, with that beats per minute, it increased brain wind brainwave activity, which meant that the brain was more active. Um, one thing that is for sure um, that researchers really, really do agree with is that if you put your kids in music lessons, like violin, any sort of instrument at a young age, it really does impact their learning. And so um, we, when I gave the talk at fall conference about the best, and I talked about a lot of things, neuroscience, but the best time to learn anything new is in childhood because 
the brain is so open to learning at that point and it's so plastic. It wants to take in everything it, it can to better prepare for the future. And so when you um, have a child that's learning some sort of instrument, they not only learn it a lot easier, but it activates all those areas that we just talked about. And it not only helps them with that instrument, but with other other things that they're learning. And this is my own my own thing that I've noticed, but I went to school with a lot of kids that played violin, like they started in the first grade and they were like at the top of my high school class and I graduated with 500. So um, so there's a, there's a link there. His, and that research is really good research. So that's called the Mozart effect. Um, here's the mathematical stuff that I kind of mentioned. So there's complex mathematical order with classical music. And this is true of other music too, but very true of classical. So rhythm, pitch, character, contrast, repetition. Um, I am not a classical music or any music expert, so I can't tell you much about that. But it does have um, some sort of mathematical order that activates left brain. The order causes a release in serotonin, which then increases happiness and um, feeling good about whatever you're doing. And it does this really, really quickly because that limbic system is the second stop after your brain takes the sound waves in and processes the sound waves. So it's really low order. So it, it can influence your mood really quickly. Um, okay, so I said mood. Mood is a kind of a longer term thing, but it can affect your emotions right away, which can then affect your mood. So how can music affect me or you? Listening to different music can give um, you different thoughts, words, and actions, depending on the type of music that you're listening to. It can intensify enjoyment in the task at hand. So a lot of people like to listen to music when they run, and that's not classical music. Um, and there are races that have actually Oh, actually, a lot of them that say that you can't listen to music while you run, one, because it's a distraction, but two, because there is a lot of evidence that you can increase your performance with music. Um, it stimulates brain growth. We talked about that a little bit with the kids. Um, and then also it influences learning and memory. And it can help you memorize things. So if you think about the songs you know, you can basically memorize those songs that you like really, really quickly. And if you are able to put things that you're trying to learn to music, you'll actually learn them a lot quicker too. But it's not all good. So here's Beethoven. And um, classical is much better than any other music. So unfortunately, classical music is about the only music that aids in processing while completing another task. And I know I'm making some of you really upset right now, but um, if you're listening to music that you like, that has words that you can understand, then you are paying attention to that and not what you are trying to do. So that's multitasking. And everyone talks about, oh, we're in the, the age where we're really good at multitasking. Unfortunately, our brain does not multitask. We can only do one thing at one time. Um, so you can't, you cannot do two things at one time. You might be like trying to do one thing and then switch to another task and then switch back. Maybe that's how you think of multitasking, but you cannot do two things at once. So if you are listening to music while working, your attention will be spent on either the music or what you're working on. It doesn't mean that that's a bad thing because I listen to music while I work and um, it's just nice to have noise in the background. All that information still gets in your brain you just don't consciously process it. So let's say you love country music and you're listening to country while you're working. It's still going to go into the brain and get processed, so it might increase your mood, but it's not. you're not going to consciously process that song or anything like that. Okay? And that's not bad, but the problem occurs when you're trying to get something done and you're listening to music that you like to listen to, and suddenly you're singing the song in your head and you realize you're not working anymore. Okay, so it can become a distraction is what, what I'm trying to say. So you can listen to songs with words in them, but it would have to be in a language that you don't know, and then it will occupy less conscious brain activity. So that's my advice to you, is to either listen to classical music or listen to music in a different language, or if you know for a fact that you can kind of block it out, then you're golden. 
So I just have one last slide here, um, and it's just talking a little bit more about some research and what music has done. So for ADD and autism, there's lots of research with music. Uh, a lot of times kids with sensory processing disorders, they either really like music or really hate it. So it really depends on the type of child that you're working with. But a lot of times kids with autism that like music, it can help them achieve their goals. Um, there was one study that was done with uh, autism and music and tying shoes. And the kids with autism learned how to tie their shoes faster and actually tied their shoes faster after they learned when it was done with music. Uh, because positive music that people like can increase brain activity and, and increase attentiveness, um, there are some studies that suggest that music can awaken the brain and that it's almost as effective as Ritalin or Adderall for kids with ADD. Um, a lot of times in school, in elementary schools, they have brain breaks where they do dancing and music. And so that's something that's used to get wiggles up, but also kind of activate the brain. Music uh, with strong beats will cause the brain to be active with that same beat. And that's where some of the running stuff comes in. So if you're doing a race, a lot of times you'll match the beat and it, um, the task becomes a little bit easier. Slow beats can help people calm. So people that are anxious, a lot of times can listen to calming music and it helps them relax. And then rhythmic therapy has improved cognitive function in older people because of increased brain power and also increased blood flow. And that's all I have. So it looks like I have about four minutes left. So if anyone has any questions, I would be happy to answer those. All right. Well, thank you, Lindsay. I see Ryan had typed in the um, in the text box. How about electronic music? And Greg kind of went off that. I agree with Ryan. I put in data listening to EDM non-lyric in my old job. Yeah. That's yep. Anything without lyrics. It's fine. So, um, yep, that would be totally fine. Like techno music, I guess, or anything like that is that could actually help you stay awake while you work. So entering data sounds like kind of a boring task. So maybe that's a good thing for that type of. Yeah. And then Amelia says, bring on the German music. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yep. Anything that's not in your well, unless you know German, then you're then it's not a good thing, but I'm guessing most of us don't, so. Yeah, and then Kelly said, I've been um, loving this app for working, and it's um, she's got the link there. Um, Becky said, but if a song I know lyrics to, I'll have the words in my head. Oh, yeah, that's very true. And then yeah. Ryan's been making playlists with no lyrics, so he's got a link there um, <laughs> nice. that anyone can listen to. <laughs> yeah. Which is kind of funny because I actually, when I was in school, I would study to hard rock music because I would actually get distracted from classical music, from listening to the, if I knew the melody. I don't know. I always think I'm kind of weird with that. But Does anyone else have any other questions or comments? This is really interesting, Lindsay, so thank you very much. Okay, a few people looks like they're typing. See if there's any other last comments. Thank you, Lindsay. I think I just got kicked off, so I'm sorry if. Oh, you're still. I can still hear you. Well, I just logged back in. Oh. <laughs> so I got kicked off for a few seconds. Okay. Um, any last? I'm guessing you guys asked for last minute questions, but any other questions? Yeah, I just want to. Um, hey, I have a question. So the the um, app that I uh, link to, it's called like brain.fm and I have it on my phone and um, it recommends only listening to music for like they say it's very intense and that they recommend only like one hour long sessions. Do you I will admit that, that I sometimes go longer than that. Is there, what What do I need to know about that? Is that, Kelly, are you the one that's talking? Yes, I am. Okay. Um. So that music's like super intense, did you say? 
Yes, it's like a, they have multiple, this, this app has different channels for um, focus, one called focus, one called relax, one meditate, one sleep. So I've been using the focus one sometimes here at the office. I'll put my earbuds in and, and listen to it, but it recommends like it's kind of like some deep, like I don't know how to describe it, like pulsing. I mean, it's music, but it has some like pulsing to it and and it 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 kind of rec I think it only plays for an hour and then it shuts off and it I remember when I like signed up for this app it it had some warning about not listening to it for more than like an hour or something because it was supposed to be very intense I okay I wouldn't say that I think it's that intense but I wondered if there, <laughs> if there is any like research about not using those kind of things for prolonged yeah. periods or something the only thing I mean I, I don't personally know about any research about that app or like super intense music the only thing that comes to mind is like when if you have like a seizure disorder or some or yeah. even like ADD if you're listening to super intense music just like if you were viewing super intense lights or something, that might be more of a disclaimer for health issues. But, um, you know, I don't know. I don't know specifics about that. Got Sometimes it. I think when there's like disclaimers like that on apps, it, it makes you a little more like, oh, I need this app because it must be super. In you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But um, like, I oh, it's going to make me 10 times yes, more productive it, it or whatever. Must work because there's a disclaimer. But um, but I could see I could see where that might be a problem with people that have, you know, like seizure disorder or even kids that are super intense all the time. And if they're constantly having that intensity with what we showed with like the brain being really active with that kind of music, it might be something that's detrimental for them. So. Got it. Thanks, Lindsay. This was super yeah. interesting. Yeah, you're welcome. And Ryan had kind of a comment question about, isn't there something about novel music as well? I hear, or I heard that listening to something for the first time can be distracting. And then Mongolian, Mongolian throat singing. Throat singing. <laughs> well, yeah, your brain's going to want to pay attention to anything it hasn't heard before. So, but eventually you're going to get used, even if it's classical or Mongolian throat singing. It it won't be it won't be something out of the ordinary forever. So, you know that first time you first or first one or two times you listen to it, that might happen. But after a while, it's not gonna it's not gonna be an issue. So, but very good very good questions. Yeah. So I don't know if I've ever heard Mongolian. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I want to hear it. <laughs> Is there any other last comments, questions, or anything? And I do like Becky's recommendations for staying alive at, for CPR beats because it is oh, the right. Idea. <laughs> yeah, it is the right beats for CPR. It's easy to remember. <laughs> Good idea. Anything else? All right. Well, if not, I'll see.